Well, now, what a pleasure it is to invite and have with us on the Comeback Coach podcast, Lynn Bowman, who we've got so much to talk about. Lynn, welcome to the show. Very happy to be with you. What fun. Well, Lynn, you've just blown me away. We had a little bit of chat before we hit record and you're sitting there looking uh, absolutely stunning. And you told me that you're, you're, may I share it publicly, what you mentioned? Please do. 74 years young. 76. You're cheating me. 76. Whip me and make me bleed for that era. 676. Terrific. Well, you describe yourself in your profile. And, and there, there's show notes and so our listeners and our viewers can find uh, Lynn's uh, website and, and link and click through and find out more. But Lynn, uh, Lynn, you describe yourself in your profile, and I want to get this right, Glam Grand, Glam, got that right, Glam Grandma who knows how to get you to eat your veggies. Now, 76 years of life and you're describing yourself as knowing how to get you pe- help people eat their edgy- veggies. Why that and, uh, and why now? Great question. And to me, the secret of everything is being healthy if you can. Nothing is a lot of fun if you're suffering, if you're in ill health, if you have spent all your money trying to, you know, there's so many things that take you down when your health isn't optimal. And um, so much, something like, you know, the statistics, we can argue about the exact numbers, but something like 85% of us who have a chronic disease now, and that chronic disease is preventable and reversible. So um, if we are going to party together in our 70s and 80s and 90s, you need, all of y'all need to start eating your veggies now if you haven't already. And uh, and it's just, it's simple. It's all about eating well and moving and having some fun um, and sleeping well. So I, I'm out here talking about all that, which you think, well, that's granny stuff. All right. Isn't it? Yes. It's totally granny territory as far as I'm concerned. Oh, I couldn't agree more, Granny. Uh, but uh, okay, so we're talking about eating healthy, and yet the title of your book almost seems like a contradiction: Brownies for Breakfast, a cookbook for diabetics and the people who love them. How can we get away with eating brownies for breakfast and still be healthy? Come to my house, or get the book and learn how to make what I make. And those brownies are made from pot- now. You Aussies love pumpkins, like we Americans do. Those brownies are made from pureed pumpkin that you get out of a can. You know, you just buy the can of pumpkin, you dump it in and cocoa, plain chocolate, nothing, no sugar, just chocolate, powdered chocolate. So pumpkin, cocoa, and then secret ingredient, number three, nut butter. So, and it can be cashew butter. It can be, um, it can be peanut butter. That's not my favorite, but almond butter is one I use most. So it's the, it's the combination of pumpkin butter and or I mean pumpkin puree, excuse me, and nut butter and cocoa, and then a you know a couple of other things, not much eggs or egg substitute. If you're vegan, you don't have to use the eggs. And you put it in a bowl and you stir it up, and it makes the most delicious, gooey, deeply chocolate brownie you've ever eaten. But the secret is, don't tell anybody. It doesn't have any sugar in it. It's made with monk fruit, and there are some other sweeteners that I talk about in my book. People have an idea about sugar substitutes that they're icky and that they don't really taste that good and so on. But if you're going to be healthy, you have to stop eating sugar. And that's, that's granny here just telling you like it is, sorry, no more sugar. If you really want to be healthy, but you can have brownies. There are recipes in the book for donuts and cakes and pies, as well as savory foods. But the secret is knowing the good sugar substitutes. And then the things that you use instead of flour and oil and, um, I, you know, butter, there's hardly any in my stuff. The se- and you can imagine that in this brownie made with nut butter, it's full of protein. So it's a meal. It's got vegetables, protein, some carbs, some good fats. It's a meal and it's a brownie. So. Absolutely just, sold. I'll, I'll take a dozen. Uh, yeah, no, I- put it on my table and eat. Come I'll, on over. When yeah. I'm there, I expect a, a plate full of them. Uh, Lynn, uh, so. You are a picture. Okay, I'm going to get serious now because this is the Comeback Coach podcast. Not that we weren't serious about uh, eating uh, sugar-free brownies for breakfast, but just on the, the 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 concept of making a comeback from setbacks, adversity, suffering, troubling times, tough times. There's a mm-hmm. lot of people right now, as you know, uh, as I know, and as as most of us know, that uh, life right now is not a bowl of cherries for a lot of people. And in yeah. fact, I, I see in your 
uh, in, your bio, in your bio, Lynn, that you've had your own experiences of tough times, including um, homelessness. Am I right? Oh, you're absolutely right. Yes. Uh, and, I mean, mistakes. Um, mine were buttes. Uh, I, I made a lot of them, as many of us do. Uh, and, but you know what, Mike? I'm a, a believer, in the end, in failure as being the great teacher, the great motivator, and I've had a few. You, you know from my bio that I was a weather person at one point. Mm. And, um, and I am proud to say that I believe I was the worst weather person ever in broadcasting in the history of the world. That's, me. <laughs> right That's the silver lining there. Yes, I got fired. Yes, I was awful. But I was really awful. <laughs> I wasn't just mediocre awful. I was terrible. But I, I wound up, as many women do particularly, uh, with three little kids, a crazy husband. He was a veteran of um, Vietnam. And like many of those fellas, he came home, changed his clothes on the plane and tried to be a normal person. And when I met him, he was a banker, three piece suit, you know, slick, good looking, tall, slick talking fella. But um, we, we married. Uh, we had three little ones in quick succession. I was thrilled. I didn't know that I would be able to have kids and here they were and it was wonderful. And he very quickly unraveled. I mean, just literally unraveled. If any of you have dealt with uh, the mental health struggles of a loved one, you know that it, it just, it can surprise you completely. And I realized that I, I could not stay with him or I would die and my children would die. It was very clear that we were in danger. So I had to leave and I had to leave fast. And I left on a train with my three little ones. They were two, three, and four. And with what we could carry, we came across the United States from the East Coast to my sisters in the, on the West Coast. And I lived in a camping trailer in her driveway for as long as it took for me to lie my way into new employment, which I'm also proud to say, you know, there are times when <laughs> When people do not need to hear the whole truth about stuff. Yeah. Uh, and what I did, I came, so this was 1980, Mike. I, I came to the Silicon Valley, which it wasn't the Silicon Valley then. It was just San Jose, California, Sunnyvale, California. And that, and my sister was an engineer, her husband was an engineer. And so, and they had a little uh, solar energy company. And so under the ruse of finding an advertising agency for her little company, I went around and knocked on doors and uh, talked to the ad agencies that I had seen advertising themselves. And, uh, you know, under the pretense of looking for an agency for this little business, I would interview them and invariably they'd say, well, so where are you from? And what are, you know, how, oh yes, I just came here from North Carolina. Well, do, what do you, do you know, you know, what, and I, are you a writer? Yes, I actually, I'm a copywriter. Oh, you are? Would you even consider doing some freelance work? And of course, inside, I'm like, yes, yes, you know, please, now. And so very quickly, I had uh, clients. And, because I actually, I had a good, you know, history of working and a good, what we call in those days, a book of stuff that I had done. So one of the few things that I brought with me from North Carolina was my book that um, was my, my resume, essentially. And a couple of outfits that I could get away with, you know, presenting myself in business. And pretty soon, because of the time I lucked out, pretty soon I was hired as a freelancer for a number of these places. And another lucky, lucky thing, I was female, but they were so desperate to get this work done that they hired women to do it. Mm. And it was, it was hilarious, actually, because it was a time when one of the things, for example, I needed to write about all the time was executives, men wouldn't put their hands on the keyboard of these fabulous new machines that we were building, these microcomputers. So this was Apple, of course, and <clears throat> other companies like Apple. And so they had to have people like me write this stuff that said to men, no, you, you, this is the new masculinity, right? This is the new smart thing to do. And of course, you, you would have to you know, have these guys, no, no, it's okay. Put your hands on the keyboard. Because until then, a keyboard was women's work. Yeah. It, you were a secretary or an assistant or whatever. And so these men were just flummoxed that they would have to put their own. But then, of course, once they did and once they saw what that opened up for them, 
they were convinced. So it was an exciting, interesting time to be in advertising and marketing. Better yet, I make good money. So, so I came out of the dirt and you know, out of the camping trailer in my sister's driveway and lucked into a little rental. Uh, and pretty soon was okay. Of course, it was a long time where my ex was stalking me and having me followed and all this sort of thing. And that's for another show uh, when you want all those grisly details. But um, but I I knew if I could earn enough money and keep enough separation, I thought my kids and I would be okay. And they are now in their late 40s. And I have two grandchildren and we're fine. We're good. Um, my ex-husband, like, and this is a thing that you also may know, more of those folks who fought in the Vietnam situation, uh, who fought in Vietnam, more killed themselves than were killed in battle. And that is still going on. And, um, you know, and now, and we're seeing this continue in, in the way we do world affairs, unfortunately. I hope not as tragically. I hope we learn from that. But yeah, so he he left this plane in 93, uh, I think. And um, and we've had peace in our family since then. Wow. <clears throat> when you say, and may I ask, when you say left this plane, uh, did he take his own life? Yes, he did. Yeah. Okay. And Mike, I, you know, it sounds odd to be um, really at peace with that, but my goal, I, I knew, I pretty much knew that's how it would end, but I so hoped, deeply hoped that it wouldn't be my children who found him or who suffered with him right. uh, that happened. And the way it happened, it was okay. And it was actually my new husband, still my husband of 33 years, who ended up sort of cleaning up things in the um, aftermath of his life for him. And I found the way these things happen in one of his boxes. I opened it up and and there was a note from him to me. So how did he know I would open, you know, life is so strange. Isn't it? Isn't it? It's a mystery. Well, that's thank you, Lynn, for uh, being so candid and open and transparent with those facets of your past. And, uh, and it's never pleasant when anybody, regardless of the circumstances that they are in, or <clears throat> may I say, the grief, the pain, the suffering that they may also be causing others. And I heard what you said of your situation that you were in and your children at the time. It is so sad. Uh, well, I'm a survivor of attempted suicide, and so I'm so happy and grateful to be here. So I, I can certainly relate to uh, all round the the um, uh, that that whole thing. And uh, I'm sorry that uh, for your uh, ex husband that that was the way that he found his his own peace. However, let's move on. Uh, it's, it's very important, but uh, let's move on, Lynn, because there's more things to talk about and including the backdrop. Now, you've got to tell me, is that a green screen backdrop or is that really your own room you're sitting in there? This is my place, Mike. <laughs> well, I tell you why I ask. Okay. It looks very beautiful. It looks very serene. Thank but you. I see there a, what looks like a pipe organ. Yeah. Come on, it, what's the story? Well, it's it's one of those that we almost had to build the room for it because uh, it's very tall. Oh, my goodness. Right? And it belonged to my husband's aunt who lived in Nevada City, California. And it's I think it's probably turn of the century, but there was a time when most of the homes that you would go into would have a version of that. Yeah. Um, I think it's actually called a harmonium. So it's a it, it's a pedal uh, thing and it has lovely sound. It, it gets played every once in a while, not by me, uh, but I have a son-in-law who's a musician. And I it, we inherited it from my husband's parents and I treasure it. I mean, it, to me, it's just a work of art. And I was glad that we had room uh, to to house it. I, I love having it in our life. And this is this room that we're in is actually technically a garage 
uh, according to the county that we're in. <laughs> we we had to rip off it. And my home is old. It's a 140-year-old farmhouse, which, oh. you know, Australia, you get this. In California, that's really old. Uh, whereas on the East Coast, it wouldn't be so old, but mm. it it's an old, old farmhouse by California standards and a money pit. You know, it's taken a lot of fixing and um, and then there's earthquake stuff that happens and so on. But I love all the crooked spaces and the little gaps between things and uh, the patina that comes with. Oh, uh, absolutely. The character, right? if you like. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I had to, thanks for explaining um, the, uh, what did you call it, graniola? Harmonium. Harmo That's the one where you put the paper in and you push the pedals and the paper spins, no? No, uh, it's just, it's, I think it has to do with, with pushing the air through the uh, pipes okay. with pedals, but um, uh, it is not my expertise. No, well, I, it, there's some energy coming from that, and I had to. Uh, it was kind of like, without sounding too woo woo and whack, way out there and wacky, it kind of spoke to me, and I had to, Good. I had to bring it up. And now that I know, uh, it feels oh. better, and so do I. It's my husband's auntie speaking to you, I think. Oh, there oh. you go. Welcome. Yeah. Uh, all right, Lynn. So you look, you've got a, a very uh, eclectic background, professional background, career background, areas of expertise. And you mentioned, and I have to bring this up, you mentioned that word copywriter. Now, it happens to be that uh, we have a number of, a good number of subscribers who are copywriters, as was I. I'm now retired from copywriting. But um, so I, I, I hooked onto that. Uh, and uh, did you specialize direct response or what what form of rock copy did, were you writing mostly? Well, I, you know, back in the day, it, everything was, I mean, we did TV. I did a lot of TV and print. But my specialty, Mike, was translating technology to consumers because so much of what we were doing here was technology that people ha didn't know what it meant or really what it did or why it would benefit them. And so I had this combination of consumer goods background and um, industrial marketing that I liked. You know, I, I, I found it exciting and interesting. My dad was an industrial marketer. And so I had grown up hearing around the table, which is a thing that I talk about all the time with young families, sit down at the table. Don't eat in the car. You know, don't eat on the road. Sit down at a table and eat with your kids and talk to them. Um, so many young families are just crazy on the run and they don't have these mealtimes anymore. And I've had all of my kids at some time or another say to me, you know, eating dinner at home was like a graduate course in marketing. Mm. We didn't appreciate it at the time, but of course that's what I did. And my friends were eating with us and that's what they did. And so we talked about it. That's what my kids heard. <clears throat> and my office was at home for, from the time, from 1987 on, I had my own company, a uh, creative services company. And so my kids knew, and then, and I did that partially because I wanted to be there when my kids got home from school at the house, but they had to learn as a consequence, there'd be barking and yelling and all this stuff going on. And the phone would ring and all of a sudden silence. And one of them would reach for the phone and go, Lynn Bowman, creative services, you know, in their best professional voice. I think, yes. So they learned those office skills out of desperation because we had to, that's how we had to run our family. You know, I worked at home and, um, they were fine with it. You know, they weren't deprived of anything or in fact, I think they were enriched. Didn't maybe think so at the time, but they were enriched by watching me make a living. What's wrong with that? Nothing at all. And it's so interesting to hear that part of the story uh, of your former uh, career in copywriting and also advertising. And you had your own company, as you spoke about. And, uh, well, let's do full circle because time always flies when you're having fun, Lynn, and we're nearing the end of this conversation, but we want to go full circle. Uh, so we're talking, uh, we've been talking with Lynn Bowman, uh, lynnbowman.com, but th that link will be in the show notes for the 
YouTube viewers and the and the audience listening on the podcast audio podcast channels. Um, Glam Grandma. Well, if you're listening to this on audio, you want to head over to my YouTube channel and have a look at the uh, have a look at the video because you wouldn't guess that this woman is 76 years young and she looks absolutely gorgeous. Uh, glam grandma who knows how to get you to eat your veggies. That can't be a bad thing either. Her book is Brownies for Breakfast, a cookbook for diabetics and the people who love them. Lynn, do you have a parting? Look, you don't get to 76 without the bumps and bruises and the falls, and you've shared some of those with us including the uh, living in, in what we call in Australia a caravan uh, in the yard of, of a relative, um, the um, separation and uh, ultimate divorce, I think you mentioned, from your husband who met his own demise by his own hand after uh, post-traumatic stress disorder after Vietnam. I suppose that would have been the, the, yep. the, the name given to it uh, in medical terms. Um, <clears throat> you know, you You've lived your life up until now. You've got plenty more life ahead with plenty more things to do. And do you have a parting thought? Do you have a, a favourite quote, a favourite book that you want to uh, mention to our listeners and our audience? My cookbook. Yeah, <laughs> wonderful. What what what, per what perfect answer to the question, brownies for breakfast. You'll find a link there at lynnbowman.com. The link is in the show notes. Lynn? I want to thank you for joining us and for being so open about uh, your life up until now, for sharing your pretty face with us and for telling us a little bit about that grand piano of sorts. I'm going to call it a piano because I can't remember the name you gave it. Uh, in the back, it's happy. I'm happy. You're happy. Let's hope we're all happy. And until next time, this is Mike Searle signing off from the Comeback Coach podcast.